Please enjoy your glance into the future and welcome Yuri van Geest. Thanks for that. Um, so, without further ado, final 45 minutes. It has been a long day, so let's start with a video to inspire you a little bit, or maybe shock you, but I'll explain the video later, okay? Here it goes. So we all know how this ended and this is not to shock or to provoke you. I, want, I would like to share two insights with you based on this, on this video. The first is the tsunami that you see, the wave that's coming our way, is a metaphor for all the exponentially growing technologies that are coming our way. That's called the singularity, the combination of bio, nano, neuro, technology, AI, robots, etc. So this is a new phenomenon. We have never seen this before in human history. And I'll explain you later on. The second point is more profound. It's about human nature. Because people in this video, probably just like me in the, the, that scenario, stay put. They, you, they interpret a new phenomenon using an existing mental model. It's just a wave, it's a special wave. Nothing fancy. Stay put, like a tourist, like classic cab drivers, like classic hotel owners. So at Singularity University, we explore these exponential technologies and we try to improve the world. And as a sort of analogy, we use this next slide. We are digitizing the whole world. Atoms, genes, neurons, everything. Products, processes, employees, people, quantified self, wearables. And when you digitize something, it changes. Let me explain. Look at photography. Physical versus digital, your smartphone, right? What changes? First, zero marginal cost. You can take an extra, fo extra photo, zero marginal cost. Second, you move from a scarcity model to an abundance model, right? I can take as many pictures as I want, no implications. Third, most importantly, the usage changes, right? Physical photography 
has to be perfect in one time, right? Digital photography, it becomes a filtering issue, selection. That means aggregation, you can put AI on top of it, algorithms, you can remix data of the photo, with metadata, think about Instagram, Snapchat, what have you. The whole usage of photos changes as a result of digitization, right? <coughs> Keep this in mind. That's old school. And this is new school, Singularity University. The same principles apply to all these technologies. Zero marginal cost, buy under our neurotech. The usage changes and we move from scarcity to abundance as a result of all these technologies. The wave we will witness in the next 20 years is the wave of the last 20 years times 50 in terms of impact and disruption. We have just started and I'll show you later on. It's the most exciting and frightening time to be alive ever. A singularity is defined as all these technologies, especially the convergence, the combination of all these technologies. That's called singularity at NASA and Google. So let me show you a few examples of exponential technologies. Solar or renewables. In the next few months, you will be able to buy solar cells embedded in Windows for only 10% higher price relative to normal Windows. Interesting. Big impact on solar and our climate. In the next, let's say, year, higher money from China and Alibaba, they will offer turnkey solutions. Oh. Turnkey houses, hardware, software services, sensors embedded, software embedded, with solar cells embedded, for construction companies across the globe. This is game changing. Why? For example, here you see solar panels, but you also see a nano fridge. Who knows about the nano fridge? Okay. In the next three years, you can create your own food at home. You buy seeds from the internet, from Syngenta. You have a small fridge in your kitchen. Seeds here, special light, lighting, advanced LED lights. Mathematical models of the growth process of the seeds. Broccoli, tomatoes, whatever you, groceries. In one day you have tomato, in three days you have broccoli. No more groceries, no more supermarket, in that, in that respect. Big impact, game changing. Decentralization of food, do it yourself food, do it together food. Democratization. This is just one example. This is not science fiction, this is coming our way. Another example, we, we, everybody believes in solar energy, right? Fossil fuels are gone. It's all in the name, right? Fossils. Get it? Okay. <laughs> so, this is something new. Energy out of the air. I can take hydrogen from this air over here. Proton, electron. Electron creates free electricity. <laughs> Proton plus CO2 in the air and the electron. I get free water, free electricity, and less CO2 in the air. I've solved three problems at once. This will be launched next year in Tibet, China. This is not science fiction. Mass production scale next year. This is disrupting solar energy. This shows the pace of change that, that we are witnessing. We have never seen this before. So what are examples? Artificial intelligence and sensors. Artificial intelligence is basically about machine learning and deep learning. We talked about that today uh, massively in a workshop uh, in the afternoon, deep learning and machine learning. But that's already a bit oh, quite outdated. Let me explain why. Google bought a company called DeepMind. It's one of the most advanced deep learning companies, startups in the world, let's say two years ago. 13 employees, one, three, Half a billion. Wow. Quite, in, quite interesting. What it does, it's self-learning software. It can detect patterns in data. 
all by itself without any human input or intervention. Any text, sound, images, pictures, photos, videos, languages, what have you. Better than human beings. So imagine software having better senses than human beings already today. Can see better, can hear better, translate soon, write better, what have you. All by itself. Impact on employment yeah. and on, on, your, on your business, by the way, big time. Market research. But DeepMind is already outdated. Now we have Viv Labs. And Viv Labs is founded by the makers of Tada, Siri, iPhone. Same founders. This is the most advanced AI algorithmic company in the world still emerging, and they will work together with sentient AI. What is sentient? Let me show you a video and then I'll explain the whole concept. Data, vast and fathomable amounts of data. It defines our age. And yet, how do we make sense of it all? How do we use it to solve our problems instead of creating more? We started a conversation with some of the brightest minds in the fields of big data, cloud, and artificial intelligence and asked that same question. We asked, what would happen if you could get evolved artificial intelligence to pose the right questions? What if you could put those questions to millions of distributed processing cores and get them to work together? You get artificial intelligence on a massive scale. You get unprecedented decision-making power distributed closer to the data you get the first massively scaled evolutionary distributed artificial intelligence technology applied to making better decisions. Inspired by Darwinian evolution and the neural networks of our brains, it works by analyzing, making connections, finding patterns, trying out billions of solutions, learning and improving, distilling, solving harder problems with better solutions, faster arriving at unexpected results that were previously impossible to see, and allowing us to make wiser decisions than ever before. Then, what would happen if you put this massive power in the hands of the greatest experts and decision makers? In healthcare, genetic research, finance, e-commerce, fraud detection? Could you help businesses and customers make better decisions? Could you prevent heart attacks or see Alzheimer's early? Could you make the world safer, better, more fulfilling for organizations, for ourselves, and for our children? What could you do? What could we do together? Now that's the real question. Sentient. So this is sentient.ai together with Fifth Labs. And you might wonder, yeah, so what? What's the fuss about? Uh, there's a big fuss. The reason is that this is the first AI system that can ask, ask its own questions and answer them without any human input. This is game changing. We talked about big data today. Big data is not so interesting in my view. What is interesting is the way on top of it, the sense of interpreting the data and the algorithms of machine and deep learning and fifth labs and sentient. That's the key USP, right, going forward. And that's impactful because 80% of all current jobs will be gone in the next 20 years globally due to mostly AI, artificial intelligence, plus robots and sensors. No worries, there will be new jobs, but it will transform. Self-driving cars, something totally different. I was in Barcelona last week, I had the privilege to sit in this car, the self-driving Audi RS7. Time for a small video. It's me screaming, so here we go. <laughs> Of course. 
course, I was very scared. But the key is, <laughs> as, you, as you can imagine, so only, I think, 50 people have done this before in the world, so it's quite bizarre. Anyway, so after three times, three corners, you are used to it, right? You feel more comfortable, but you still have to laugh because of the tension. But the funny thing is, when it takes a corner, you realize, holy crap, I will never be able to leapfrog this. It's so perfect the way he does it, the car. It's twice, three times as good as I would do it. It's so risky. You just don't believe it. You just think it will fly out, right? It will go nuts. But it takes it. It's, it, it's perfection. You feel perfection. It's unbelievable. It's scary. But then I realized I'm outdated, right? I'm outdated. Welcome to the blockchain. Who knows about blockchain? Okay, it's a big impact. It's the biggest wave ever we've seen. Think about the video, the tsunami, right? This is the biggest technological revolution ever in human history. It's a trust protocol, a trust machine. Also shown on the cover by on The Economist two weeks ago. So it gives you a sense it's already mainstream. Let me explain what it is. Think of writing, think of printing, think of the telegraph or wireless, or in many of our lifetimes, think of the internet and smartphones, technologies that have changed everything. So radical that before they hit, they're almost impossible to imagine. And yet, a few years after, it's life without them that defies imagination. So what next? Well, there are plenty of very rich individuals and corporations betting big that the next game-changing technology is called blockchain. We see the power of what this blockchain can become. Venture capitalists see this. But even more exciting is the disruptive minds of entrepreneurs are seeing the power of this. And they're building new businesses and new paradigms that are going to change the shape and the face of all industries. OK, so enough with the drum roll. What exactly is blockchain? Well, it comes from the shady, anarchic world of Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a self-regulating digital currency. It doesn't need a central bank in charge. How? Well, it uses a blockchain. This is an immutable ledger of who owns what. Every time bitcoins are transferred, another block of data is added to the chain. Like the DNA in every cell, a complete copy of the blockchain is held by the entire network of users. Therefore, if you tried to cheat the currency, trying to spend what you haven't got, well, everyone else would know. But this same technology, many believe, could be used to track anything of value. And there are thousands of other potential uses, from pharmaceuticals to luxury prestige goods like watches and handbags. The music and film industries are excited that blockchain could be the technological answer to piracy. And the insurance industry thinks it might help tackle fraud. Blockchain actually holds out the prospect of smart contracts. That is, contracts that police and enforce themselves. For example, suppose a car makes a journey. A road use payment could automatically be triggered. No need for a big central database, no need for enforcement authorities. Blockchain holds out the prospect of fraud-proof, cheaper transactions, liberating businesses and markets to develop in ways we can't yet imagine. So, the blockchain basically is a central database that logs all transactions in the, in the world. Yeah. All supply chains, all value chains, all vertical markets, what have you, right? And why is this important? Let me show you. Tell you. Uh, the basis of each transaction inside a company or between companies, right? Is trust. So now we are able to automate trust for the first time ever, without a bank, without insurance companies, without a government, without any trusted third party. So if you can automate trust, a digitized trust, you are upgrading the whole operating system of the economy and society on planetary scale. This is already bigger than the internet 20 years ago, in terms of investments. This will make the world much more efficient, effective, more honest, more authentic, more real, less corrupt, no more fraud, no more piracy. It will be game-changing for your business, because all the transactions are open, open and transparent for everybody to see including market research data, for example. 
and the whole supply chain of any physical, material, or financial good will become transparent. Think about the implications. We've never seen this before. Blockchain. Those are just a few technologies yeah, becoming mainstream. They double in capacity every 18 months, just like Moore's law, sometimes faster, sometimes slower. As you can see over here, here you can see the technologies, here you can see the cost drop in the last seven years on average. So 3D printers have, have dropped 400%, 400 times in the last seven years. The robots, 23 times. This is already outdated, now it's $1,000 two years later. It's unbelievable, same functionality. Um, I have my personal DNA profile at Singularity University six years ago now. I was there for the first time. It used to take 10 million US dollars eight years ago for your whole genome, your DNA profile. Now it's less than a thousand, eight years later. The first DNA profile used to take 13 years, 2001. Today, less than an hour. Only 40, 40 years in between. We've never seen this before. The speed of change, the cost drops, it's a new wave. Think about the video. So we move into a programmable world, radically decentralized, and it's full of abundance. Why? We have an abundance of information, communication, internet, soon abundance of energy, solar energy, and from the air. We have an abundance of education, the massive open online courses, the modules. We move to abundance. Soon we have abundance of healthcare. In the next two months, everybody in this room will have a medical tricorder from Star Trek, Star Trek for a small fee launched in January next year. It's an abundance of healthcare. You become the CEO of your own health. You become the CEO of your own energy, solar energy. You become the CEO of your own education, the MOOCs. You become the CEO of your own real estate. You can 3D print your own house today Within one day, using concrete, for a tenth of the normal price. So what's happening in China for two years? Xingdao unique, you can check it out for yourself. Big, you become the CEO of everything in your own life. Radical decentralization, but connected, but full autonomy. Do it yourself, do it together, all by yourself, using technology. So then the question becomes, if you believe this is true, and this is true, these are all facts, by the way. <laughs> Nothing new, I tell you. This is all... There was a guy who foresaw this vision 50 years ago, talking about futurism. Amazing. A man from Greece. Anyway, so keep that in mind. I tell you, not, nothing new. But we look at Singularity University, how, what are the implications of all these changes on organizations, or organizational models? So, Salim Ismail is the founder of Singularity University, and Peter Diamond is the co-founder of Singularity University with Larry Page and Ray Kurzweil, and Mike Malone, the ex-chief editor of Forbes, and me, we have worked on the book for three years to look into the implications of organizations. Now, we have been nominated for an Oscar recently, so we are happy about that. Um, for management books, I maybe mean, think it's 50, maybe you know this prize. Anyway, Go to the facts, right? The half-life of your business competency used to be 30 years, 30 years ago. Now it's only five years. If you work in IT, your half-life of your knowledge is only two years. 90% of the Fortune 500 companies are not on the list any longer in the last 60 years. And this is accelerating. What's going on? Some go bankrupt. Most become less impactful. The average lifespan of an S&P 500 company used to be 70 years, 100 years ago. Now, this is already outdated. It's 12 years today. 12 years. Go figure. What's going on? Next 10 years, 40% of this list will be gone. Some go bankrupt. Most will become less impactful, less market share. What's going on? This is going on. Exponential technologies, doubling in capacity every 18 months, more slow, bio, nano, neuro, all these things. 
And this is happening because I'm, I've been in, in the singularity movement of all the technology in the last 10 years. It is accelerating. It is disrupting our whole planet in a positive way, mostly. But also globalization and new startups. The time it takes to become a billion dollar company used to be 20 years, 20 years ago. But now it's, it's already outdated, now it's nine months. So in only nine months, like Slack, for example, the company's startup called Slack, you can become a billion dollar company. And of course, there's a hype to it and buzz and bubble to a certain degree, yes. But not like 15 years ago, it's totally different. So we see that the rise of a new organization that can scale exponentially. So the book is about scalability. Not about strategy, not about customer centricity. It's only about scalability on the organizational level. That's it. So why are there exponential organizations today? Why not 20 years ago? Reason one, the environment has become exponential. But our organizations have been linear for the last 100 years, right? The industrial model. Top-down, centralized, hierarchical, scalable efficiency, optimization, control, linear sequential product development, right? Twice the input, twice the output. Twice the amount of employees or resources, twice the amount of products and services. Linear, right? We need to close the gap. Airbnb, Uber, and Netflix, that's old school, right? We all know that. But this is happening in each vertical market, including your business today. So we have to close the gap. Become exponential as an organization. The second thing is more profound. If something is scarce, talent or resources, you have to own it for competitive advantage, right? Scarcity. But now you have abundance, right? This example, for example, 100,000 years ago, everybody in this room, you see an apple tree, apples are scarce. We created technology, a letter, apples are abundant, right? The same is applicable to the internet. It makes information and communication abundant. And so energy with energy, as I told you, told you earlier. So technology is a way to transform scarcity into abundance. So if you have the abundance of talents and resources, then the question becomes, not ownership, but access is enough for competitive advantage. Not ownership. And especially in an exponentially changing world, access is better than ownership. You know why? Because of the depreciation rate increases. The pace of change is accelerating, right? You become rigid. The more you own, the less fle flexible and nimble and agile you are as a company and as an individual. Third, key point. We have scaled up technology and systems in the last nine years. Eh? Cloud computing, software as a service, Amazon Web Services, right? We all know that. But technology is just one building block of an organization model. We have strategy, structure, culture, KPIs, people, and processes. These new exponential organizations, they have learned to reinvent all seven building blocks of an organization at the same time, from scratch. It's a systemic transformation of organizational models. We haven't seen this before in the last 100 years. They scale the whole organization, not just technology. Who in this room is using a mobile phone of 15 years ago to survive in today's exponential world? Anyone? Sometimes there are any, so very courageous. Nobody, okay. Okay. Then why do you use an organizational model of 100 years ago to survive in today's world? Please explain it to me. Please. Okay. Just kidding. Okay, so this is something new. What are exponential? Right? First the why, then the what and the how. Think about previous presentations to a certain degree. Exponential organizations are at least 
10 times faster, more efficient, and, and or more effective than classic linear organizations in the same vertical market. They leverage different exponential technologies like artificial intelligence, algorithms, 3D printing and 4D printing, 3D robots, industrial robots and sensors in their production and systems. And they use new organizational techniques uh, for strategy, structure, culture, what have you, right? APIs. Okay, got it. Do less themselves, larger, bigger impact, right? Okay. We zoom in. Software is in the world. Mark Anderson. A car company used to be a hardware company, now it's a software company. Tesla is a computer on wheels. They want my Audi experience. It's all software, right? Also interesting, by the way, for market research, eh? because if you are in a self-driving car, the car becomes, becomes a hospital, an entertainment center, full of sensors for healthcare, for market research, neuroscan, what have you. It's all there. Attention. Check out the scope, for example. In a car. Yes. So, so, a construction company a building company used to be a hardware company, atom based. Now it's a software company. This whole room here, it sounds unbelievable, but it's true. You can create this room using robots and drones, bottom up, using 3D and 4D printing. It's already happening in China. And you have artificial intelligence and sensors in the wall. These are all software driven technologies to a certain degree. And you can use graphene and nanotechnology as a building material, also IT software driven to a certain degree. So this means a, a building a construction company is now a software company. But what? We talked to Paul Poma, the CEO, a global CEO of Unilever recently. He said, okay, the book, best book he has ever read in his life, he told us. Now everybody in Unilever is saying, we have to become a technology company in the next 15 years. Every employee, right? Because food becomes software as well. What do you mean? Okay, let me show you what I'm saying. Who knows about this device? It's called the SCIO, S-C-I-O. It's a food scan. So I can scan any food or drink or clothing or medicine by pushing a button, close, close by, of course, one centimeter. It can show me on my mobile, uh, on my smartphone app, the content of all these products, uh, products yeah, goods. Food, vitamins, minerals, fats, uh, carbohydrates, what have you, proteins, allergens, toxins, calories. This makes the whole food market open and transparent. Big impact on new level, right? Same will happen for each vertical market. It becomes open and transparent. And food becomes software. Why? We can already 3D print food. I talked about a nano fridge. There's also software embedded in there, and a methodical model for the growth process of the seeds. So food increasingly becomes software as well. We are digitizing everything. Okay, gotcha. So every company becomes a software company, also your business increasingly. And I think about blockchain, algorithms, and artificial intelligence. So these are the characteristics of exponential organizations. I will go into detail because of time reasons. I have 12 minutes left. But let me, let me show you a few nuggets. On top is very important. It's called the massive transformative purpose. Most of these companies have a higher goal to improve the world in terms of sustainability, with Paul Polman, you uh, but also healthcare, social inequality, unemployment, how to tackle these issues, right, for wellness. So, if you have a purpose, what happens? You have lower transaction costs and higher retention. The best people come to you, partners, employees, customers, because you have an aspirational goal. With power of pull effect. No push needed. You pull. Flexible workforce, got it. These are all exponential growth drivers. Scalability. On the inside, we have ideas. Those are stabilizing factors. When you grow exponentially, 
You need stability for the dynamic balance, right? Makes sense. If you only grow, what happens? Anarchy, chaos, whatever. And it all will come, blah, blah, blah. You've seen the whole story time and time again. Balance is key, and all these attributes are self-reinforcing. They're synergetic. They amplify each other. Take a look. Let me few, show you a few others. Community and crowd. These exponential organizations, they only produce products and services. They outsource all the other stuff to their community or loyal fans and customers, marketing, sales, service, but also innovation itself. Concepting, design, prototyping, the whole thing. Are these some cases? Not the company, the customers among themselves, peer to peer. A platform organization, right? And soon the community becomes your factory. That's the next step. Then we call it cooperatives, we do it together, right? Peer to peer organizations. Peer production, not far away. Happening in each vertical market as well. Okay, outcomes we know, why? Machine learning, deep learning, artificial intelligence to personalize products and services. Think about Google PageRank, Amazon recommendation engines, Netflix recommendation engines. These are all algorithms. Much more scalable relative to human input or employees. Better to update, less mistakes. Go figure. Leverage assets. How can you leverage the assets of your customers as free supply for your business? Think about Airbnb, some customers supply free sleeping spots. Airbnb doesn't have to invest anything. And this is happening everywhere in each vertical market. How can you leverage the assets of your customers? So you have zero marginal cost on the demand side using social media and referral marketing. So no advertising budget needed, right? Check, we know that. But now, at the same time, the zero, you have zero marginal cost on the supply side. Because the customer supplies for free. So what happens? You become more nimble, more flexible, more agile, and your gross margin skyrockets. And you have double network effects on the demand side and the supply side. You cannot compete as Hilton Hotel or Hyde, what have you, right? That's why Airbnb has a market cap of 25 billion, and they're already profitable, huh? making almost two, more two billion a year now. And it only exists for six years. Just like Uber, market cap 70 billion. Same story, leverage assets. Engagement is defined as gamification plus incentive competitions plus digital reputational systems. I'll skip that one for time reasons. Skip this one as well. Dashboarding, that's important, let me explain. I worked for corporates for seven years. You wouldn't say it based on my clothing, but it's true. Uh, HP, uh, Liberty Global, what have you. I had a job review once or twice a year. Maybe look just like you today. I didn't like it. Why did it motivate me, didn't learn, blah, blah. These new companies have real-time dashboarding for their customers, but also for their employees. Like Google, for example. Google has 50,000 employees. Each employee can define its own personal or product professional goals to, on a weekly basis, open and transparent for everybody to see, all their colleagues. What happens? More learning, more motivation, short feedback loops instead of long feedback loops, twice a year. Correcting mistakes quickly, especially important when you grow exponentially. And most importantly, more collaboration, less politics, more team building. People are helping each other. They know each, other, each other's goals and the progress. Game changing. CEO of, uh, of LinkedIn has said it has been the biggest driver of the success of LinkedIn, Elliot Hoffman, in the last five years. It's called Objectives and Key Results, OKRs, weekly goals, open and transparent. Experimentation is defined as not as agile, as old school, but as defined as lean startup plus design thinking combined. So build, measure, learn, build, measure, learn, 
and for product innovation. Not sequential product development that, that's outdated, only works in a stable environment. Okay, autonomy, self-organizing teams, <coughs> radical decentralization of authority, yeah, less middle management or no middle management, self-guiding teams everywhere for each key role of the organization. Social is email is dead, they don't use email. They move from vertical communication systems to fully horizontal communication systems. Real-time synchronous, that means activity stream, streams, file sharing, Dropbox, file task management, and so Asana, Notable, Slack, Trello, they use these platforms to collaborate in real time in their teams. Effect, more learning, more team vibe, better energy, less politics, more productivity. So, sum it up, from linear has a business plan design after one year you talk to a customer. Doesn't work in exponential world. What does work is build, measure, learn on a daily basis. Amazon has a platform update every 11 seconds. Facebook has decentralized full uh, accountability and ownership for each developer. So each developer can update the platform. They are full responsible, of course, but without any huge mistakes. This is, this is game changing. So they trust, they gave more trust to each developer in Facebook every 11 seconds as well. So this is different, eh? short feedback loops. Thinking, doing, thinking, doing when you innovate. Not thinking for half a year and then doing and learning. You test your assumptions every day of the customer, their use case and your solution. Daily. I'll go a little bit longer because I was allowed to, so if you don't mind. <laughs> okay, here we go. This is the old model, risk elimination. This is the new model. Procter and Gamble and Stata, they have failure awards to change the culture and to change what you get what you incentivize. So if you change the KPIs, you change the culture, right? Failure awards means every year the people who innovated but failed but learned the most and shared the most to their colleagues. 10,000 US dollars or more, promotion, plus recognition by the CEO at the largest event every year for employees. Results, cultural change, more innovation. Mark Zuckerberg has said, if you, the, biggest, the, big, the biggest risk today is to take no risks at all. And if you, if you don't innovate and only do incremental innovation, you are outdated. It disrupt or be disrupted, think about the video on the wave, disrupt yourself or die. That's the key message. Cannibalize your own business. If you don't, somebody else will, including myself. My personal motto is, and I really live this, everything I see and encounter and witness, it's all just a permanent museum. It's all an assumption. It's ephemeral. This is the reality of the new world. Everything becomes an assumption because of the pace of change. My book is already outdated. It's a year old. We started four years ago, imagine. So it's way outdated. <laughs> That's true. Anyway. Here we go. Innovation, the old way. Do everything yourself, right? Here comes the insight. The best people, by definition, would work outside your company. Google says that. 50,000 employees, because you have 3 billion people online. How can you tap into 3 billion people towards your organization? Okay. Staff on demand, product, community management, etc. The best people work outside your company, by, de by default. So the new model is this, a smaller core team of full-time employees, community management, more crowdsourcing, more community, and more staff on demand, flexible workforce, using all our marketplaces. Do less yourself, outsource more to your open ecosystem of different stakeholders. That means you flip the organization inside out. 
And we have researched 300 companies in the last four years. This is the key pattern. Ownership is old school, unless it's something is scarce. If the robots are scarce, Amazon bought them, yeah, Kiva. Tesla, in particular, the resources were scarce, let's say the batteries back then, you own them. Makes sense. Yeah, think about the factory they are building in the Nevada desert. That's already outdated, by the way, but anyway, just say. Um, some examples, because of fuel cells and some other developers with lithium ion batteries, if you want to know. Um, who knows about GitHub? Okay, of course. Okay. So, GitHub is mind blowing, one of the most interesting experiential organizations in our view. Why? Two things. They recruit people using three P's employees passion, purpose, and potential. Passion are you a self starter? Are you entrepreneurial? Inside out instead of outside in? I don't have to manage you. Purpose, do you have a higher goal in your life? And does it fit with the purpose of the organization, the MTP, the Massive Transformative Purpose? So I don't have to, to micromanage you. You're already aligned on a soul level. And potential is measured by the level of curiosity. One, two, learning to learn and unlearn. Three, creativity. Four, collaboration. And five, most importantly, are you resilient? Do you stand up quickly when you fail? And if you don't fail, you get out. Because you go slow enough, not fast enough, and you don't take enough risk in this new world. So, potential is all future-oriented. Meta skills. In the past, we, we took resumes and LinkedIn profiles, right? It's all past-focused. It doesn't matter, the track record. An expert is somebody who will tell you why it cannot be done, increasingly, not how it can be done. Why? It's exponential. My notes also are dated. I'm a dinosaur. And if you don't believe you're a dinosaur, then you are a dinosaur, right? That's the new world. Because of the pace of change. Think about the wave. Oh, it's a wave. It's, I know this wave. It's a beautiful wave. No, it's a different wave. It's something different. We have to rethink everything you've learned about strategy, organizational models, business models, product innovation, everything is being rebooted as a result. So you come in at GitHub, the second point, first day at the office, what happens? You can do whatever you want. You can innovate with permissionless innovation. You can contribute to an existing product, no permission for, for the other manager. Flexible job roles, flexible job descriptions. Not fixed in the box. Skip this one. Xiaomi, 50 billion in only five years in China, smartphone manufacturer. I like this example. Hire. Who knows about hire in China? 80,000 employees, okay. 30 years old. Eight, nine, nine years ago, they told the CEO, told uh, the employees, need to become exponential. Okay. That is an exp a corporate transformation example. He transformed 80,000 employees into 2,000 individual startups in one corporate architecture. Think about this. It's never been done before. Impact from 10 to 60 billion in the last three years, less middle management, full decentralization and autonomy, community management, customers were innovating for the company, the employees selected said to the CEO, every three months you can stay or go, the employees. Own customer focus externally, own P&L responsibility. Work. So finally, how do you create an exponential organization? Very briefly, then I'm done. Step one, transform leadership. More women and young people in the executive team and the board. So if you are then you are much more effective. I'll skip this one of time. Identify, invest, partner, and acquire exponential organizations in your business that will disrupt and will complement you. So it's a hedge for the future. Create a portfolio and optimize that. The third step is more difficult. Disrupt yourself on a product level and organizational level, black ops team. That means, this is an important point, 
If you innovate near the core business, or cash cow, what happens? You activate the immune system of the cash cow, it will create the antibodies and kill your innovation. Sounds familiar? Okay. So what do you do? You innovate on the edges. Small teams, lean startup, five teams, internal people, external, young and old, report to the CEO, not the CFO, middle management, because they, they, they will kill the idea because of internal politics, and they will focus on execution. That's it, not on innovation, not the KPI, right? So, small teams, totally independent, every three months evaluate based on learning KPIs, not financial KPIs, because then you kill it, that's shareholder value. Eh? Short term, doesn't work for radical breakthrough ideas. Okay, finally, you have to revitalize your core business, but it, yeah, we work for a lot of clients globally. In most cases, we say, okay, phase out your core business, use the cash, and it's a cash cow to invest in this, in this, and most importantly, in this. Disrupt yourself, part of the incubator accelerator, and your own corporate VC and hackerspaces to create a stake in the future, cannibalize yourself, start killing your core business today. And this is the toughest decision to make. Nine out of 10 will fail, including our clients. They are not able to crack the culture issue. And culture eats strategy for breakfast, right? We all know that. We don't share history with our law. So this goes down. The question becomes, do you have the time and the guts to, to invest in this and this in time? If you don't, you're gone. And this explains the stats I showed you, and this explains the video, why I showed you the video as the first slide. Thank you very much. It was a great pleasure. Time for maybe a few questions. Sorry for being a little bit late.